Hello, and thank you all for coming. When I was asked to do this talk, it made me actually have to think about what do I actually do and where do I actually do it? So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have a better understanding of what I do and where I do it and what it is to be the Hadrian's Wall National Trail Maintenance Ranger to give me my full title and how you go about managing a national trail within the setting of a World Heritage Site. So in doing the presentation, I think I'd quite like to do three things. I'd like to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'd like to tell you, and then I'd like to tell you what I told you. And it's these things, these three actions, that hopefully will help you remember stuff. So what we're going to look at is who I am, what do I actually do, what is a footpath, because that is my place of work, and what is a national trail, because it is different than a footpath. We want to look at what the trail wants to be, and we want to look at what can affect the trail. And then taking all that into consideration, what am I actually responsible for? So we'll start with a very simple thing. This is me. As you can see, the hairline is receding. The hair has turned grey. One of the things that I am is that I'm old. I'm not asking for sympathy out of this, but in getting old, it means that I've done lots and lots of different things. And in some ways, it's a combination of doing these two things is how I approach managing the trail. Because in some ways, the only things I'm doing is either prescribed management or problem solving. You have to remember when you're working on the trail that you are literally crossing the country. You are passing through many, many people's lives and they tend to come and say either something is very good or there is a problem. And in order to be able to do all these things, you really need to have application and experience. So by being old and having had a varied career, it kind of helps because I generally know what to do and when to do it. So starting as a very simple point of view is what is a footpath? As I've previously said, it is my place of work. It crosses the country and it owes its origins to the National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act of 1949. This bit will be a little bit wordy, but I'm just trying to establish the parameters that I actually work within. Now, the footpath existed before 1949, but when the Act came into being, they were tasked with creating a definitive map of rights of way. This creates a network of footpaths around the country. And the point I'm trying to make here is that a footpath is a thing. It's not a concept, it exists. Its location exists and its location is definitively recorded. The point I'm making is that we can't just move it around for our convenience. In some places, the footpath is perfect. In other places, it's not quite so and it's more difficult to manage. The easy solution is to move it, but we can't do that because it is where it is. The National Trails also owe their origins to the 1949 Act, but they differ in such as they are promoted as long distance routes that incorporate a lot of these individual footpaths. An example I'm going to give you is if we think about the footpath around Mapfern, Northumberland. It's a lovely path. I've got some pictures coming up of it later on, and we're walking happily along a footpath. Well, that footpath has a number. At the end of it, we step out onto the side of the road the highway, it's still a right of a way, but predominantly for cars. We walk along the side of the road on the pavement and eventually we reach Car Hill. We step off the road and back onto a footpath. There is two footpaths and a highway we've used, but we have stayed upon one national trail. You need to know the designation of the footpath in order there to properly manage what the footpath is. So when I use the word footpath a lot, I might actually not be talking about a footpath. I might be talking about a bridleway or I might be talking about the highway. You just need to know these little bits of details. And um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to move the little thing out of the way. And then Hadrian's Wall sits upon a scheduled ancient monument. And this monument also requires us to go that little bit of extra mileage. 
Now, the reason we have to go that extra mile because of the designation of the scheduled ancient monument, it's a SAM. And because we travel all the way through the country, we travel through lots of designations. And it's important that we know what these designations are because we can't interact with them correctly if we are unaware of them. So we have a lovely picture of Hadrian's Wall coming down towards Sycamore Gap. As I've already said, Hadrian's Wall is a scheduled ancient monument, but it is also sitting within the World Heritage Site. In this example, it is sitting within a national park. In this example, it is a site of special scientific interest. It's a special area of cons uh, conservation, and it's an area of outstanding natural beauty. You can have a nature reserve, you can have country parks. There's lots and lots of different environments that we travel through, and it's important that we know what all these things are, because then we know how to interact with them. So that's sort of the, the thinking part of it. The actual physical part is what am I responsible for? And in simple terms, I am responsible for the surface, the walked surface and the furniture. And by the furniture, I mean any structures along the trail that cross the trail. Don't run alongside them, but cross the trail. Now, this is a perfect example. This is hot bad in, and this is Hadrian's Wall. We have a bit of a wall tumble here, and then we have a fenced off corridor. So this is a perfect example of what we'd want. We have a wide path that is sufficiently wide and even that these two walkers feel comfortable enough to spread out. So by this one single act, we have halved the impact upon the monument because people are spreading out 50%. 50%, 100% use. Now, if you think about it, you can look down here, you can see that the path actually drops away into a lower section, and here it rises to a higher section. And these people are in the middle of what they perceive to be the flat, nice place to walk. The grass over here tends to go quite vigorously and it pushes in through the fence and you can sort of see where I actually cut it away because nobody is going to walk in there. But if you perceive that to be the edge, you mentally move away from it. And what we'd end up doing is pushing people from towards the archaeology. So this is what we want to do is create width. This is what we want as a surface. And even if you're not going to use it, figuratively speaking, you will pick the middle of the available width, not the width that you're actually going to use. A lot of what I do in some ways is kidology. I trick people into walking the way I want them to walk. Touching on the other aspect of it is I am responsible for the structures at the end of this section. There's a wicket gate there and there's a uh, kissing gate at the top end here but this fence that runs along the inside of it that is not my responsibility and a lot of the time I do get approached by landowners saying that the fence is down the path is being damaged I need to fix it so it's one of those ones that we need to know what we're responsible for because if I fixed it and it subsequently broke I would be asked to fix it again and again, and at some point, I perhaps might say I'm not fixing it anymore. But at that point, we would be at the point at the very beginning when I said yes. So everything subsequently after that yes has become irrelevant because I have now said no. You need to manage people's expectations and therefore you need to know what you are responsible for. In other situations, I may make an exception. This fence definitely benefits me. It allows me to maintain the surface in good condition, and it allows me to do it in such a way that it's easy. So for instance, if the fence fell and he approached me, I could say to him, I'll pay for your materials, but on the understanding that I'm not taking the responsibility, the fence stays intact, the cattle don't get onto the path, and I can work quicker, which is cheaper, because I don't have to spend as much time. So eventually I will get my money back. So they are exceptions to the rule, but you need to make sure that they understand that this isn't my responsibility forever. Because if we did do that, we would increase the workload of what we do and the responsibility going forward to the point that we can't actually sustain it. So you need to say no, but only if no is an appropriate answer. So what do we <laughs> actually want as a walk surface? Something like this. 
because this is the Maxton Monument that I refer to. It is lush, it is green, it is beautiful. It is obviously sufficiently wide that these people feel comfortable spreading out. It's got a fence running along the side of it, stops anything coming from the field into the path. It is good. It could easily be described as usable. It's got to be fit for purpose, because if I made a really, really good path, but it wasn't in the right place, nobody would use it. And then I'd have two paths, the one I made and the one that people use. And it's the same as if it's not very usable. They'll just go to find an area that is and you'll end up having two things to manage. So it's got to be usable. It's got to be sustainable. You can't keep coming back and repairing things year in, year out, because you just can't afford to do it. And as a management technique, if you did do it and then had your money removed, all of a sudden it would collapse because it's not sustainable. So what you want to do is build something that can withstand the level of usage, that is quite an important factor, for a reasonable amount of time, because you can't make things forever. The only way you could do that would be concrete and it would look awful. And thinking about looking awful, it has to be sympathetic to the landscape because although lots of things are important, the setting is very important. People come here for leisure. People come here to enjoy themselves, to get to peace. And that means it needs to be beautiful. It needs to be sympathetic, not jarring. So having spent a couple of minutes explaining that this is the perfect surface to manage the Hadrian's Wall National Trail on, I could point out that if we try to transport this to the quayside in Newcastle, it would not be sustainable because the level of use would have increased so much that surface would begin to cut up and deteriorate. For a small period, it would be usable, but also it would not be sympathetic to the landscape because you would have a heavy concrete landscape with a green path running along the side of the quay. So it has to be sympathetic to the landscape. And by that, no one surface is an appropriate surface for all shoes. If we take this to a slightly bigger context and just break the trail down into a few sections, we've got the Solway, which is a tidal estuary. That means it's prone to flooding. It's also got common land on it, which means it has animals roaming upon it. This is different than the two urban environments that we travel through. What Carlisle and Newcastle don't follow the line of the wall, but they do both run along the side of a river. Emerging out of Carlisle, you'll enter into lowland pasture. And by pasture, I mean land that carries animals. And animals have hooves and hooves push into the ground. So that can have an impact on the path. The other side, you tend to have arable. And by arable, I mean crops. And crops tend to have a field margin. And it's that field margin that the path travels along. And then nicely bridging the two, we have upland pasture or the wind sill, if you want to think about it. Now, upland pasture, is different in that you tend to have a shallower soil so it's harder to sustain the grass because most of the soil runs down to the lowland pastures. So immediately we now know we need at least five different types of surfaces to fit the five different types of uh, environments we're going to travel through but we could actually take this to the bigger bigger picture and then we could introduce the transitional points so coming from the Solway into Carlisle is significantly different than traveling out of Carlisle over the M6 heading towards Brampton into the Lowlands and so on and so on and so on. So all of a sudden we now have 10 types of environments that we need to create surfaces for. And all this highlights is that you need to find the ideal surface for the location, not for what you want, because it has to be sustainable. It has to be sympathetic to the setting. Actually, if I just knit back here, you could go for the bigger, bigger, bigger picture and pretend number five is housesteads. Most people visiting houseteads will go up to the hill, excited to see the fort, and then perhaps if they've got a little bit of extra time, they'll head west and look at Mark Castle 37, perhaps even go as far as Sycamore Gap before returning and then dropping back down. Few people will visit Housesteads and visit the east. So in this 500 metres on number five, you can have a different level of capacity towards eight than you have towards nine. And these are the points where you've got something to see. So you've got all the environments, but then you introduce parking, tourism, 
features and all of a sudden areas have different levels of impact so you just keep adding to it and it gets more and more complicated but going back to what's simple this is what we would like this is Adrian's wall the width of the path here is two meters it tends to be twice the size of my cutting disc so the ride on mower cuts a meter square I have to drive back because I've drove away so I might as well be cutting because otherwise I'm just doing nothing. So it tends to always be double the journey. It also needs to be level or level-ish, because if you see, this isn't technically a very level surface, but there isn't so much of a drop that makes a difference. These people feel comfortable enough that they can walk side by side, if you remember, halving the impact upon the monument, but also, it's not taking that much grass that the farmer is going to get irritated with me. Because if you think about it, two metres wide, 50 metres long is um, quite a big bit of grass. So it also needs to be level in respect to the surface. So if it was pitted, for instance, if it had little holes in or little hillocks, as you're walking along, you subconsciously see all these little things. And you can guarantee if you put your feet here, your feet are fine. If you drop your heel into half a hole and a bit of grass, you could potentially roll your ankle. So if the ground is still two meters wide, it's still level-ish, but if it's pitted, you will probably do this. You just will. It's the safest route. You pop your way through it. But what we've actually done by having a bit of a pitted surface is we've reduced the walk ability to about 25% of what's available. So then we could think about how do we address this? We can't go digging holes because we're in the monument, but sometimes you could have mall activity. And instead of just spreading it thin so that it just disappears into the ground, you could collect it up pop it into the hall and fill it. And eventually over a period of time, you can eliminate these little obstacles and open up the full width. And then people will spread out. They won't think about where they're going and all is good. So going into a little bit more detail, what they did when they put the proposition for the trail together is they wanted to create what they called the green sword. And this in effect is a wearing membrane that separates the walkers from the underlying archeology. span and it's wearable and sustainable because it's soft, it's grass, it yields because it's grass, it grows back because it's grass. It is a very good thing to use and it also looks quite nice. Now, if I approach, like I say, with a cutting disc, I tend to do it this way on the right because the cutter throws all the grass out to the right. If it threw it out to the left, what you'd end up with after you've done it is a big pile of grass running down either the middle and people would walk either one side or the other as it is it puts it all down there and if this grass wasn't quite as long as it were what we've actually done is delineated where the path is we have clearly marked it people like to know where to go so by doing it in the manner of one side up one side back throw it to the outside and you end up with a nice green sword so we now have somebody approaching uh, I think it's turret 29A. They are very excited. They're looking at the turret. They can see the wall. They're wondering what this is. Their level of expectation is high. The one thing they are not doing is looking at where they're walking. And I can almost guarantee they are walking there because it's the middle of the path. So this analogy, just think about driving your car and you're on a country lane it's a big old country lane but you haven't got two lanes you've just got the one you're driving merrily happily along and you see a car approach you with the headlights as you get near you start moving to the left but they start moving to the left you pass you don't necessarily slow down by doing it that way you've clearly demonstrated that it is wide enough to accommodate two cars but as soon as you're past you move back to the middle you just do because in the middle the least can happen along the edges, you're just not sure. So what we have to take into consideration, although we've created a two meter width of path, predominantly it will be the central point that people use, unless they have a friend. If they have a friend, they will approach together, both excited at looking what it is, both going that way. So what you end up with is the one third half and two thirds point predominantly being where people walk predominantly being where your wear lines if they develop are going to develop 
Going back to the beginning, I have stipulated that a footpath exists and it is catalogued on the definitive map. So there's not a lot you can do about where the footpath is. But the way I manage the footpath is to a higher level because we're a national trail. So I perhaps cut it to a higher width. And what I could do, for instance, if it was beginning to cut up a little here, the next time I visit, I could just approach it from a slightly different angle and bring it in here. They are still the one third, half and two thirds point, but it's a point of a narrower path. I've changed the width but not the dimensions. This allows this area time to recover when it's suitably recovered. I could, if I fancied, moving them back over there. And by the simple act of how you approach something, you can change how people stand upon the monument. And then for you can mitigate the impact that these people are gonna have upon the monument. Another thing that we need to take into consideration, I bet you're beginning to now think that you never realise cutting grass could be made to sound so complicated, but we need to think about aspect. The sun is in the south, we are a northern country, and therefore the southern aspect is the one that faces the sun. The sun makes an appearance, the sun shines down on the path, the path feels the full brunt of the sun and it lays in sunshine and all is good. But the opposite of this is sometimes the path has a northern aspect. The sun still exists, but this heavily wooded area here stops the light from penetrating and it passes overhead and the trail is in shade and things are not so good. Now, there's nothing wrong with what's going on here. It's perfectly fine and adequate, but the aspiration for managing the trail when it has a northern aspect has to be realistically less than if it has a southern aspect because you just can't achieve the same goals. So taking aspect into consideration, we can revisit one of my particular favourite slides and we can look at the bigger, 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 bigger picture because now... If we had Matt van Lonnen over here and we've got a southern aspect, it is better than Matt van Lonnen over here where it has a northern aspect. So I can get better results here than I can get here because I have a more resource than the natural sun. So you need to take into consideration lots and lots of things when you set yourself your objectives. So that is looking at some of the things that we would like the surface to be. And occasionally, the surface does suffer damage. This can be significant for other factors. So this bit is at Port Broom coming into Carlisle, and the whole area got washed out with Desmond. And luckily, Cumbria County Council, Natural England, the Environment Agency, all worked together to rebuild the whole flood defence system. They put these piles into the ground, they backfilled it, they planted loads of willow, the willow roots will knit together and hopefully hold it on, and then they put the path back on top of it. This is a little bit beyond the daily maintenance, but what isn't beyond the daily maintenance is the surface vegetation. So if we did nothing and we removed the animals from the land, the grass would grow abundant and then the grass would get rank and then the rank grass would get bushy and the bushy would get trees and eventually it would become a forest, apart from at altitudes where trees can't be sustained. The point I'm trying to make here is that you need to do maintenance. So this is the path in 2006. It's been open three years. There's a lot of gorse that's been cut down over a period of time to present the path in a better way. This is the south, so the path has actually got a southern aspect. So all is good. Well, what I'd like you to look at or notice is this little rascal here, the little wispy bits of gorse and You've got various other clumps of gorse up and around here. 2006, just two years later, this has happened. I kid you not. So there's little Mr. Wispy and the other lot have gone like that. And you think, really? Really? But the problem is when they cut all the gorse down, they took everything above ground and left everything below ground. So as soon as it started growing, you have a huge root system and very little foliage. So all the energy is being pumped into these smaller areas and they grow like mad. It's the basic concept of coppicing. So that was 2008. It's not a disaster, to be honest with you. It looks all right. The path isn't affected. It's just not as good. Two years later, hmm, I'm beginning to get a little bit annoyed. 
The wispy is consolidated into a bush. The bush has got a lot denser and a lot thicker. A couple more years later, and now the footpath has got a northern aspect. The bush has reached sufficient height that the sun pushing over the top does not reach it, and the surface is beginning to deteriorate. This is not a good thing. Two more years after that, and you can literally see that that bush and that bush very soon are going to connect, and the path will become blocked. And you can almost see the way you would walk up the middle of it, and then you squeeze your way through there, and then you nip back into there. None of this is good. But 2014 was also a good year in that the trail was changed in how it managed to introduce what we call partnerships. Kerry alluded to it a little bit earlier on. The partnership here was between the Northumbrian County Council, Cumbria County Council, the Northumberland National Park Authority and Historic England. And this partnership employed me and various other people and we started tackling some of these trail issues but one of the things that partnership does by being a partnership it works with other organizations so through working with other organizations in this example it was the Hadrian's Wall Community Champions project a couple of years later we managed to do this significant improvement now looking at it the work was done in 2016 because this is spring and the fact that you've got bare earth here and then green earth here and then if I go back to the first picture the bush is there so what happened in 2015 this section was chopped down through the year of 2016 it grassed back up and in the winter of 16 this bit of bush was cut down and in 2017 that will grow up there's still a lot more gorse here there and everywhere and it's again getting down to that thing if you do all the walk work in one town you just make a rod for your own back because you're going to have to carry on doing all the work in the same amount of time so we do it in stages manageable stages so a few more years later and we are back to where we were in 2006 the same situation resides in that all the root system still exists under the ground here and this is the thing that we're going to try and do differently imagine the root system exists and it is at 100% capacity. What we want to do is remove that capacity. And the way we're gonna do it is in the spring, we're gonna let it use some of its energy up. So it's gonna put 15% say of its energy out the ground because it needs to create new twigs, new stem, new foliage, new buds, and that takes a lot of energy. Once it's got all that up and running, in effect, it can start growing. But at this point, I'm going to nip along with my strimmer and I'm going to knock it all back. I can't do it all year because I'd just be here all year knocking it all back. So what I do is I just knock it back and then the root system has only got 85% in and then I let it go. It's better than having 100% in. Now, Roots tend to work in two ways. In the spring and early summer, they're using their energy that they store in the roots to promote growth and get as much foliage to maximise the photosynthesis process. And then towards the end of the growing period, they start actually putting the starch back down into the root system for next year. So the 85% of spring, we let it go and it puts loads of energy out. And then towards autumn, just before it decides to start putting the energy back in the ground, we come along with the strimmers again and we knock it all off. The ghost is not happy, but I am very happy because now the root system has only got whatever that equals, 35 and 50, it's about 50%, but it probably got some in the ground. So say that overall, it's lost 30% of its potential and we have no more gorse growth. The following year, we do it again. And the following year, we do it again. And over a period of year, you can impoverish the whole root system so that in 2021, this is what it looks like, a thing of beauty. One of the other factors is that when you start funneling people into the narrower areas, the surface can cut up. And we'd quite like the surface to be nice and flat and even, like I've already spoken about. And this is not smooth, flat and even. And it is a scheduled monument, so I can't just go and dig holes up to bring soil in to make it smooth, flat and even. I don't really want to import soil because soil does vary depending on what the underlying geology is. 
So one of the ways we can do it is we can wait for the blessed mole to make an appearance. The mole makes a mole hill. And then under what we call the generic consent, I can scoop the mole hill that is above surface into a wheelbarrow and I can collect it into here. I fill it all in. There's the wheelbarrow, there's the bag of grass seed, and there's one of the trail rangers. And what he's doing is knocking all the gorse regen down. It's quite a simple act if you do it when it's little. It's very difficult when it's big. It's all to do with timing. So here we've used all the molehill soil to fill in. Not everything, because we haven't got enough. If we used it so thinly to cover as much as possible, we would, in effect, do nothing. What we need to do is fix something so that it becomes fixed. And then we move on and fix something else so it becomes fixed and so on and so on and so on now it's got roots it's got grass seed what we do is put a little bit of a rubber matting on it and this will stop the whole surface being damaged until the roots can become established what we don't want to do is have the grass grow up through this rubber membrane because then it would become part of the earth and the phrase contributing to the monument would come into effect. And I'm not allowed to put things down because it's a World Heritage Site and it's a scheduled ancient monument. You can't just do things. But if I didn't do anything, when I removed it, it would rip up everything I've done. So every so often you've got to come along and figuratively fluff the sheet, get a little bit of air between the top and the bottom. And if you do all these things, this is what you can achieve. This is the line of the rubber sheet now that I have removed it. Oops. It's not perfect because it's not sufficiently wide. I had only what I had. And in some ways we use this as an experiment to sort of try and find techniques that we can use to use repairs that are sustainable and ongoing. And so here, this is what it looks like now. I would think a vast improvement. Having looked at a few of the things that I spoke about, if you look at the tree, the only bit of shade on the path is by the tree. You could argue that this teeny tiny bit has got a little bit of a northern aspect about it. And if you look, the only real bit of erosion that we can see is in this little section here. Now, if you're approaching this, you're admiring it saying, oh, we were worried about this little section because I thought there was a lot of ghosts here, but this is just beautiful. And then you see the tree and you become worried. You're not really sure, but you suspect the tree may be similar to the oncoming vehicle. And you think, do you know what? I better move out of the way. So we are in the middle of the walked path until there is an obstacle, what we perceive, and you can't help it, but you are directed away from it. And then you move back into the way it is. So at some point, I'm gonna come along and I'm gonna nip these little branches off. But if I did it all at one point when they weren't as much, I'd make the whole thing look lopsided. And it might seem silly to wait some point, but it gets back to the setting. It gets back to why people are visiting. There are lots and lots of other things. So I could have just knocked the tree over and it all would be good, but it just wouldn't quite be as nice. You need to know what to do and you need to know when to do it. You may be tiring of the mole hill, but some of the other problems that we come across is that slopes present an issue because you tend to dig your feet in to get up the slope. So in this example, we use the mole hill soil to fill all the little divots. We put the rubber matting down, but in this one, we contacted Historic England before we did it and asked for permission to leave the rubber sheet in situ. And what this creates is a grippy surface. So now the surface has an underlying rubber membrane that you can get tread upon and you don't have to, as such, kick the monument to get up on top of it. We have contributed to the monument, but we sought the correct permissions before we undertook the work. So... A big issue is water. And this is sewing shields. So this is the top behind the woods. And this is Mike Collins, that's from Historic England. There's Tim from the County Council. And this is me explaining that we have a slight problem. The line of the wall runs along here. And as you can see, this is very muddy. So what people have been doing over a period of time is they've been moving more and more towards the wall mound. And if you've got really good eyesight, you can kind of see how the ground is being caved in here because you're putting your foot on, trying to avoid the mud and pushing it down. And what you're actually doing is you're moving the wall mound bit by bit into this big puddle. And this is not what we want. So my proposition was water stands because it can't drain. So I can usually clear the goop away and I'll get down to the hard surface that's stopping the water draining away. 
I suspect there's kind of like a geology thing going on under here where there's maybe a slight bowl and it just holds water, but because the trail passes through it, very dry, very dry, very dry, very wet, and then it goes back to being very dry. The usage keeps stirring the mud up, so it never quite gets time to settle. So what we proposed here is we get some sheets. Now, these have got individual cells, and they're meant to be used in places like car parks and things. You'd fill the cells with soil and grass seed. The roots would lie beneath the surface and always be protected. Uh, but in this case, what we want them to do is create little voids, and these voids are designed to fill up with water, and then let the water dissipate. Fill up with water and let the water dissipate. So we put a sacrificial layer down first. I sought permission for this one. And then we put a walk surface on top of it. And then all the mud that I scraped away, I put along the sides to hold the thing in retention so it doesn't move when it's been used. And although it looks very, very messy, it's actually functioning quite well. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have enough mud to fill all the holes, but over a period of time, it will eventually fill itself up. And then a couple of years afterwards is what it looked like. And then earlier this year, this is what it looks like. So there's a bit of a, a bit more soil required, but if you take in the big picture from the beginning, where I was standing in all that mud. This is where I was standing, and that is where they were talking. So another good, simple improvement. And this is exactly the same thing. This is at Stanley Plantation going towards uh, above Corbridge, and this water is coming off the road, and it can't penetrate the hard layer beneath it, so it tends to sit. People walk the trail and stir up the mud, so it never has time to settle. So I scraped all the mud off, I laid the wearing layer underneath with the holes and then I put another one on top and this is what we get. We lost the sound, but that's the original situation. This wood water can't move out of the way. And when I spin around miraculously, the surface now has got one underneath, which is holding all the moisture, and then one on top, which is what the walk surface is. I think at the end of this, I do spin around again. So you can sort of see the state of the path. It's not quite, where's my mouse gone? It's not filled in in all the spaces yet, because again, it is the monument. And again, I can't go digging up holes to fill it all in. But as people with muddy boots walk along it bit by bit, they'll deposit on it. So again, another simple solution. Sometimes it becomes quite significant an issue. So this is, uh, this is at Rock Alicia heading towards Cara. And you can see, where has the path gone? Where is the bridge? This is a disaster. Is this deep? I don't know. What do you do? I'm going to get wet. I'm not happy. I turn up there and I enter panic mode thinking the trail's blocked. What do we do? Well, what we do is we step back and think, when they built the path, they didn't put the bridge underwater. It was above the surface. So it's the water that we need to get rid of. We don't need to do anything else. This example, imagine that you've just had a bath. It was a lovely bath. You're very relaxed. You get out the bath and you want to empty the bath. You have two choices. You can sit on the toilet, get a teacup and decant everything into the sink, or you can pull the plug. The obvious answer is you pull the plug. But here, the obvious answer is you would start tackling this standing water. And you can't do it because the issue is more water is entering here than can leave there. The solution was 100 metres down to the left, where this drain passes through a field wall. The field wall is quite a narrow gap. It's sufficient, but over a period of time, it's silted up. As it silts up, it becomes more muddy. As it becomes more muddy, it gets more vegetation and it slows it down and gets more silty and so on and so on. So figuratively speaking, I arrived here, travelled down to the blockage, removed it, or figuratively fitted the site with a stent. And then I came back up here, sat down and waited. I introduced time to the equation and time did this. More water is leaving than is arriving. The path is being displayed. Now I had a little bit more work to do along the edges. So I set to and did this. Now all the water has left through there, we have sufficiently lowered the water table that the water being held in these other sections is now being pulled into the water, into the drain and away. Again, 
it looks very muddy, but I return every year and just clear out the drain channel. It takes about two hours. It took two days to do all this because of the time involved in waiting. So that was when I'd done it the year afterwards, and this is what it looks like now. Through daily maintenance or yearly maintenance, you can keep on top of problems. And look, this is a significant drop in height. I'm not really sure what's coming on. Aha. So all the things I've talked about are things that you can undertake through your daily maintenance. When you're there, you can do the appropriate bit of work. Sometimes you can't do an appropriate bit of work because it's just too big an ask. So here, this is cat stairs. So this is Hadrian's Wall coming down there. Lovely little section of wall there. I really like it. And then you're coming to a gate. You're coming to a pinch point where people are being funneled in. And if you look back at it, you're travelling down here. You can see bare rock. Bare rock is a little bit slippy, so you're slightly worried about falling. But you can see that everybody's been going down here. So I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to go down there. And it's like, oh, just, oh look at the mess. No, I don't want to go through there. I'm going to go over here and climb over the wall. Oops, the wall fell over. Well, that's not so bad. I'm going to walk through there. And then everybody's been doing this, and the mud bowl has got bigger and bigger and bigger. And all it is, is like the, the previous slide, we need to remove the water or we need to raise the surface. Those really are our only two options. But it was a significant amount of work. So in this example, I contacted Historic England. I explained that we had a significant problem developing. This was work I only took about six weeks ago. Um, so what I did is put a document. I'm not going to go all the way through this document. I'm just going to highlight some of the things that I have to do to get permission to do the various bits of work. So firstly, I showed both sides of the path. You can see how the natural comes down and it drops off into this little bowl. There is a drain that runs along there, but it is insufficient to do what it's meant to do. And there's quite a big millstone flag there. So taking this information, I put a description of where we are and the problem. I then identified in a location where the problem is and on a map you can clearly see the water that's where it is and then the water meanders its way down before going into the peat bog here i demonstrated that the drain has become ineffective by removing the pipe and showing that the water is standing not as it were draining and then also this is the important one i demonstrated that underneath you can see the aggregate so these black bits here, these black bits here, these are the aggregate surface that was put down for the path. So everything that the mud is sits upon the original aggregate surface that's probably sunk because the area's got so wet. So what I wanted to propose was that we set the new surface on top of the existing surface. There was nothing new and nothing intrusive done. On this side of it, I needed to reintroduce the aggregate so that when the water hits, it's shed away from the path, not uh, build up within the path. And I didn't really want to carry everything up here because it's all very, very heavy. So going back to almost the first slide, the bit of wall collapse is not my fault. You could argue that the fault in the gate created the thing, but still. But what I did is I approached the farmer and asked that if he brought all the materials on site for me, I would fix his wall for him on the understanding that I'm not taking responsibility. He was more than pleased with this and delivered everything up for me. Having got all that in place, on the other side, I wanted to remove the drain pipe, create some new capping stones that would protect the pipe um, from beasts, animals as they come up to allow it to still function to some degree and build a series of steps that would take it out of the mud. Because mud, once you stop using it, settles. Once it settles, it becomes a bit grassy and then you get roots and it dries up. So if we can get you out of it, improvements can be made quite quickly. I put all this into a document and sent it off and through a bit of dialogue, we gained the permissions to do the work in a stipulated manner. So the farmer brought all the materials up on site and through a bit of process, I extended the flags one by one, one by one. And on the other side, I took the drain out and I capped it. These stones don't need to be as big as the ones I use there because these are quite expensive, but they need to be sufficiently robust enough to be able to have a cow stand on them. I didn't have enough, so I haven't quite finished this side of it and I haven't finished that side of it, but we did want to revisit the whole thing after a couple of months, so that's not so much of a problem. And on this side, all the aggregate was missing from there. We put it in in such a way that the natural shape of the land will shed the water away and all this will become mushy once more 
and the field wall we rebuilt so that the cattle won't be using it or the sheep won't be using it. So this area should begin to settle down again. And that's what it looks like now. We come off the pitched path onto the nicely uh, sloped aggregate, 20 mil to dust. When I say 20 mil to dust, I'm basically meaning the stones that fit in are up to the size of 20 mil. Imagine it like a bag of marbles, but they're all 20 mil. The whole thing will just keep rolling around. If you have 20 mil to dust, you have a mixture. So when you put it down, all the big stones have all the little stones in it and it knits very, very tightly and becomes a good walking surface. And it's tilted to the south, so all the water's shed off. You step through there onto the surface and up onto the natural. All this area has been grass seeded, this is where I haven't got enough flags and we'll come back and revisit it, put more grass seed if we need to it. And we will look to see what we've done has achieved our goal. If it has, all well and good. If not, we will approach Historic England again to see what can be done about it. That's about as much as I can talk about for the surfaces. Let's talk about the structures. A structure basically means in some way or shape, it's in the ground. You can't go digging in the monument. So what we do, is have a document called the generic consent. And when everything was put together for the trail, it was all put together under the supervision of archeologists and they created a watching brief, i.e. when the hole was dug, there was somebody there to record what it is. And therefore, if a structure breaks, I can repair it as long as I repair it in the manner of like for like, because basically I am replicating something that's already been done. So for instance, I can fix a sign as long as I put the same sign back in and back in the same location. I record the work I've done, so if there's any query, I can clearly demonstrate that the work I've done conforms to it. And if we want to change anything, then what we need to do is get an archaeologist to watch us dig the new holes. And in doing so, we'd create a new watching brief, and then that structure would become a like-for-like -like structure. But again, if we wanted to change it back, we'd need to go and go through the archaeologist. This is a simple example of it. This is this post here has broken. It snapped at the bottom. It is only being held up by these posts here. When I remove them, the whole thing will fall down. As you can demonstrate, it snapped at the base. They always tend to break here because in the ground, they're solid. Above the ground, they're solid. But at the point from ground to surface, it's the point that goes wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. And it's that sort of expanding and shrinking and expanding and shrinking develops the weakness. Now, I have to remove this bit of wood in such a way that I can clearly demonstrate that the new gatepost I put in is in the same hole. And I do that by careful excavation of the hole. The hole was dug originally for the post to be, so there's nothing new there. But if I stop, about six inches shy, I can usually get the post out and clearly demonstrate that the new post went into the old hall. And therefore, new post in old hall, gate done, job done, photographed, and we just move on. That was a simpler example. Same thing. This is snapped, held in place by these rails, but the cradle itself has got a little bit weaker. We don't really like it. So whilst we're here, we decided to do the whole thing. I like this one. Yeah. Nice. So that was um, like for like structures. Now here, the National Park will donate some money to improve access. And one of the ways you can improve access is you can remove ladder styles. They're a bit tall, they're a bit awkward, especially if you're carrying a big bag. So where possible, we'd like to change it, but we need an archeologist to create a new watching brief. He's doing a fine job of just hiding behind the style at the moment. So we had all our permissions in place before we set about it. I couldn't do all the work in one day because it just took too much time. So I had to leave the original structure in place because by the end of the day, we had to fence it back up to make sure that animals couldn't get to the other side because they are excluded. Um, we returned back the day, took out the fence, hung the gate, and then reboot both bits of walls. So we can affect change, but it costs considerably more with the other factors to be taken into consideration and the fact that you may be digging new holes into the monument. This sometimes happens. It's the same sort of thing. This is a rubbish structure. It really is. This fence is basically held in the ground there 
and there. So it's got no strength in this direction. And what you're going to do is you're going to put your hand on here and you're going to pull yourself up. And by pulling yourself up, you pull the structure that way or if you're coming from it the other way. So it's got no strength from this direction, but the only force it takes is from this direction. So it just gets wobbly. It's rubbish. But it's in the monument and it's failing. So I need to do something soon about it. But I actually don't want to spend my money fixing it because I don't like it. But if I fix it, I'm not going to pull it out because I've just spent good money on it. So what we wanted to do is come up with a different solution. So if you can see coming along here, we've got a little baton. Sorry, this baton here runs all the way along the top of the fence and we have 20 mil to dust aggregate making the walk surface. This was put in by the path when it was formed. So this is part of the original work. So we thought what we could do is we could remove this part of the structure and we could put a big millstone flag in here and that flag would be heavy enough to support a gate. So when the gate moved, it didn't wobble the ground underneath. So we then sought permission for that and we gained permission on the caveat that we have an archaeologist there to watch as we remove the aggregate that was originally put in to create the walk surface. We then commissioned the contractor to build the gate and this is what he did. The flag is sufficiently heavy that when the gate is open, it doesn't move. If it was a quite flimsy thing, the whole thing would wobble, it would just be rubbish. Now, Having talked at length about lots of things, I hope I'm giving you the sense that I kind of know what I'm doing, but I got this wrong because this is beautiful. I'm very, very proud of it, but it's actually four centimetres too narrow to get my lawnmower through. So coming in here, if I'd made it bigger, I could have just drove in there, cut the grass and drove out. As it is, I have to stream it because there's no access. So if I'd done it just a little bit bigger, two centimetres there and two centimetres there, job would be a good one, but I'd so focused in on solving one problem, I didn't really step back. So even when you know everything, you can still get it wrong. But here, you can demonstrate, there is the tray with the aggregate. We removed about three, four inches to the heart of the flag, got it level, rebuilt the associated structure, and voila, no new digging on the monument, no new holes within the monument, but an improvement on access. And then finally, you might be pleased to hear, some gates aren't actually in the monument. So the path comes in over here, travels up that hedge line, and it comes here. This is, um, this is how Gill, just above um, Lanacost. But the wall itself comes in over here and travels in this direction. So this is not in the monument. And all of a sudden, you can kind of do what you want. What you want in respect that it has to sit on the footpath, but the way it sits on the footpath, you can change things. So what we did here is we had to rehang the gate. Sorry, just go a little. And then um, when we looked at it, if you look that the gate clashes onto the cradle here, and then the sleeper in here, if you bear those in mind, once I'd hung the gate, I decided to start tacking the cradle, build a bigger cradle so the sleeper's there, take all the structure down, and there's the sleeper. So if I go back to the first picture, the kissing gate and a little bit of fencing and the sleeper. The sleeper never moves. The gate hanging post never moves, but everything in between can be changed in such a way that you can make a bigger, more accommodating kissing gate. And the only reason we could do this is because we were not in the monument. If we were, we could still have done it, but we would have had to have the archaeology and the watching break and the justification for digging new holes into the monument. So, Taking all these things into consideration, I can't possibly remember everything. I can't possibly know what's happening everywhere. It's just not realistic. But what we do have is this bunch of people. These are all dedicated volunteers who come out in their own time and they all have one of their own sections of the National Trail. And they monitor survey, pick litter, make minor repairs, and most importantly, feed information into me. And that way, I have got 100 sets of eyes and they can tell me what's going on and I can be where I need to be at the right time. So all those, all those things that we've been talking about and doing, we can only do in some ways because of this bunch of people. So they can't be underestimated. 
And I just thought we should acknowledge them just before we approach the end, which is where we are now. This is the Hadrian's Wall National Trail on a programme that we call Collector. So this is on my laptop and I have a smaller version on the phone. So on the phone, I can affect change on the laptop from where I have, ever I am in the field. For instance, I could lay upon the land, the monument. So somebody has reported in that there is damage. I'm not sure where it is, but I then zoom in and I put the line of the monument on. You can pretty much see the purple line of the trail follows the line of the scheduled ancient monument. It's very important to know when you get to something, is you are digging a hole in, or outside of the monument, because it's going to affect whether you do or don't dig that hole. If we drill down a little bit further, we can put another layer on, which is what all these flags are. All the structures, all the gates, all the styles that I've spoken about have a flag, and these flags use the traffic light system. So green is everything is good. Yellow, maybe it's on its way out, but it's all right for the moment. And red, there is an issue. Now, the issue could be that there's been a breakage and the structure no longer functions, but the red also could be that the structure isn't perhaps ideal, it perhaps isn't what we want, but to change it is going above and beyond what we actually can do. So that's something that I would, I would feed into the partnership and we would look at, on a bigger picture. Perhaps we just need more money. So some reds can actually stay on collector for quite a few years. There's Stanley Plantation and this is the Errington, well, it's the coffee house now. So drilling down a little bit further on the app on my phone, I can highlight the red. We know it's a piece of furniture. We know it's a style and we know it's a lot of style so we can come in a little bit more and we can see that I've said that it needs replacing it is a style and we would quite like to replace it with a wicket gate Tim is the county council guy that I work with and he's going to do the SMC the scheduled monument consent and then here we've got a picture and we click on the picture and we can clearly see so this area was run as two farms and then the farmer over here retired and the farm fields we divvied up and now the same farmer has both fields so we approached the new land uh, owner as it were and asked if we could change this structure for a wicked gate because the fields are unsimilar it doesn't matter as much whether if somebody left the gate open stock passes through the farmer was very amenable he's really nice guys james and so we got all the permissions required and it's just now waiting for tim to put the smc in and for us to get the money and we can affect change so that's how we record what we record is what we're going to be doing here so we create folders for, for a year, each three months, and everything that I do within the monument, I then make a little file of. So if we look, say, at 17, which is in 2018, we can go into there, and these are the types of works that were done within the monument that were recorded. So the bridge redecking would have probably been contractors, but you've got hedgerow management. That could be... Uh, so this is over in Northumberland. This is the north side of it. This is a big old hedge. Military roads just are down here and uh, Harlow Hills over there. Now, the hedge is awfully seeded itself onto the line by the fence. And this is growing and this is growing and this is narrowing. So we could leave it and leave it and leave it until the point where it has to be done. But then what do you do with everything you chop down? Because this is a ploughed field. We can't leave all the rubbish in the farmer's field because when it comes and harvests his crop, it's going to be livid. This is uh, John and he's an excellent farmer as well. He's really good for us. So what we want to do is do it when it's little, little and often. Take it all out, we can just mulch it up and we can keep on top of it. Uh, what else have we got in here? Another example would be a gate repair, put the date, put the grid reference, bit of an explanation, and then a series of photos clearly demonstrating the hole, clearly demonstrating what's wrong with the post, and clearly demonstrating that it's all gone back to normal. So having said everything that I said, this is the summary. We've talked about what is a footpath. What actually is it? And it exists. It is a thing. It is specific and its location is specific. That location is catalogued on what we would call the definitive map. We then talked about what do we actually want our footpaths to be? We want them to be as wide as possible so people spread out as much as possible because this mitigates the impact on specific locations. We then looked at how the footpath can be affected in a negative manner, either by things like flooding or by the vegetation encroachment. And then we touched on the structures. 
What do you do when you're working within the scheduled monument? We use what we call the generic consent, which allows me to dig holes in the monument as long as that hole had previously been dug and I put something back the way I found it. And then finally, we looked on how we actually record all the things in such a way that we conform to all the designations that the trail passes. Because again, I've talked about lots and lots of specific things, but you have to remember, we travel across the country. Lots of things matter. And then, having said all that, and I'm thinking I'm coming up to the end of my hour, there is oh so much more. I didn't really touch on the fixed point photography. I did use it, the pictures of the ghost that Alan Whitworth took. I think he's actually on here as well. They allow us to be able to recognise change and they allow us to clearly demonstrate how things have been affected. And they also show how things once were. So if you approach a problem, you might think that that's the way it is, but you can clearly demonstrate that this problem has arisen over the last 10 years. And what you're trying to do is not change it, but put it back to the way it were. I didn't really touch very much on the working in partnerships, but I work very, very closely with the Northumberland County Council right of way in the Cumbria County Council rights of way and both inspectors of the monuments I work with various other organizations I work very closely with all the farmers there is lots and lots of people and you can't do all this on your own we talked briefly on the volunteer section but only briefly we didn't talk at all about volunteer projects where some of the bigger jobs like the ghost you use volunteers to do because many hands allow you to do the work but then you don't need it's like if you do everything you make too much work for one individual but if you use lots of people you get it done and then if your management's correct you can maintain it going forward because it's manageable Corporate events are another good one. They're exactly the same sort of thing, is that you're bringing many more hands and you can tackle bigger jobs that you couldn't otherwise do. And again, we didn't talk about the passport scheme. We, you can use a right of way throughout the year. It is your right. I can't stop it. Um, but what we can do is use a passport scheme. And that passport scheme will allow us to sort of promote usage in the drier summer months. And this will allow the monument to be in better condition. So I think, oh, and we didn't talk about people counters. Again, you could put some of these in and around the places and then you can identify where you need additional resources because you can see that lots of people go one way and not so many people go the other way. So there's lots and lots and lots and lots of things. But hopefully the ones we've covered have given you a good insight in what we do. We could just keep going on and talking about the bigger, 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 bigger picture. But that's me. That's me walking away. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much.